Chapter Sixteen of East by West: A Journey in the Recess, Volume Two, by Henry W. Lucy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen: Christmas at Cawnpore. With the thermometer at eighty in the shade, with roses blooming in the gardens by the wayside, and violets scenting the air in the memorial gardens, it is hard to believe that this is Christmas Day the imagination is not greatly helped by the scene around it is impossible with whatever good will to imagine trotty veck with his red comforter twisted round his head by way of turban a pair of trousers made out of a cotton duster and for all other clothing a bright yellow cloth hung about his shoulders nor is tiny tim to be recognised among the heap of half-clad children that swarm in the streets though heaven knows some of them are sickly enough. When night falls, the condition of affairs grows more homely. It is cold enough for the most seasonable Christmas weather. Unfortunately for comfort, domestic arrangements in India, at least as far as they are known to the wanderer in hotels, do not recognise the contingency of Christmas weather. The great problem of life in India is how to keep cool, and to its solution all the energy and ability of the house-builder are bent. We dined last night at Lucknow in a comparatively small room which had six doors and every one of them open. There was a fireplace and some fire in it, but it was set back well into the wall so as to secure the minimum of obtrusiveness. The doors in houses here are not moderate-sized apertures such as serve at home. They are slices out of the wall, cut broad and high, and it comes to pass that a dining-room is actually composed of a series of pillars, the rest of the space being open doors. This is delightful in the hot season, and well enough in the daytime, even at Christmas, but at night it creates discontent. Anglo-Indians keep Christmas time with the jealous affection with which they cherish everything that reminds them of home. A sprig of mistletoe or a bough of holly would create unbounded enthusiasm could it find its way to an English bungalow today. That is impossible. But since it is the custom in England to deck houses and churches with evergreens on Christmas Day, we have our show at Cawnpore. The porch of the veranda in which I sit at noon and write, grateful for the shade, is festooned with ropes of mango leaves, with garlands and marigolds drooping from them. Running up the posts at the gate are two gigantic plantain leaves. Thus is every large house in Cawnpore decked because of Christmas Day. The memorial church is filled with the scent of roses of which thousands bloom on the pillars, the arches, the pulpit, and the altar. Here, too, the mango leaf plays the part of holly, and the plantain makes believe to be mistletoe. Walking out before breakfast this morning, we met many servants hurrying along, carrying to their master's friends the compliments of the season, and big bunches of fragrant roses. We spend our Christmas day all by ourselves, sole tenants of the hotel, which, by the way, is an exceedingly pleasant and comfortable hostelry, a rare thing in India. It was formerly the officer's mess-house, and stands well back from the road in the shadow of monumental tamarind trees. It is called the Original United Service Hotel, whereby hangs a tale. The present proprietor had a house a short distance off called the United Service. Some time ago it was burnt down, whereupon a smart native opened another house for which he borrowed a name that stood in high repute with travellers to Cawnpore. This did very well, till another native opened a house which he called Number One United Service Hotel. This necessitated the first pirate numbering himself two, and now we have the original. The comfort which smiled through tiffin and made fresh promises for dinner, with the table prettily decorated with flowers, evergreens, and a generous bill of fare, 
was destined to suffer rude eclipse. It was the plum pudding that did it. If there had been no plum pudding, there would have been no catastrophe. As it was, the landlord, anxious that the day should pass off worthily, ordered a plum pudding, and gave into charge of the butler, as the head native servant is called in India, a tumbler half full of brandy. This the butler incontinently drank, and in the course of half an hour was hopelessly drunk. His baleful example spread with alarming rapidity. Every Christian servant on the premises, eager to do honour to the festival, got drunk. Only the Mohammedans, unbelievers, remained sober. Unhappily, I mean in this particular connection, the cook was a Christian, and had been overtaken before he had carried into full effort the generous intention of the bill of fare. The consequence was that practically we had no dinner, and the entertainment of watching the butler with his glance fixed on a distant object, walking up the room as if the floor were a tightrope, holding in his hand a hot water plate, from which the water either oozed out on the meat or trickled over his trousers, began to pall after the third course. The manager apologetically informed me on the following day that he had soundly thrashed the butler, a proceeding which, it appears, is becoming somewhat risky. "'You cannot lift your hand now to one of them fellows,' said the manager, with fine indignation, "'but they have you into court and your fine five rupees. It's perfectly scandalous, and will be worse. It's since this Ilbert bill has come on. It's very bad for us here, owing to the resident magistrate. It's Colonel Wheeler, whose sisters and father were slaughtered by Nana Sahib. Yet the man's as gentle with the natives as if they were English. He listens to all they say, and as often as not goes with them. Once, when he was on leave, we had here another magistrate, who was a man. It was Colonel... Blank. He had not been in office five days before he had turned every native out of it. If a native came up complaining that he had been thrashed by his master, he made short work of him, and the man didn't trouble to go back to court. I chimed in the manager's wife with a sigh of regret. Colonel Blank was something like a magistrate. He was always just. Now, the manager continued, we can hardly call our house our own. Can't knock a fellow down if he's insolent. Can't thrash the cook if he's late with dinner. But I gave it the butler last night, and he daren't go to court, or they'd ask him where he got the brandy from. There was a gleam of comfort in this, but on the whole the good old times seemed to have departed from India, and the stereotyped notice posted in country hotels, earnestly requesting guests not to ill-treat native servants, but to report delinquencies to the managers, is growing out of date. Cornpore is built much after the fashion of Lucknow, being spread over a considerable plain, breaking forth into streets of houses in unexpected places. It is a busy place, being the principal grain market in the district. It is also a headquarters of the cloth trade. There are two large cotton mills here, and a third is being built. But its interest for the English-speaking race centres round the places where is kept green the memory of Nana Sahib's cruel treachery. The story begins to be written on the bare space of ground where a few stones mark the lines of the camp where General Wheeler entrenched himself with his little army and his many camp followers. In the first week of June 1857, all India was in revolt, the fire burning most fiercely in Oud, whence the fiery cross had been sent round. Delhi was held by the rebels and the descendant of the old Mughal kings had been tumultuously reinstated upon the throne. John Lawrence held the mutineers in check in the Punjab, but Henry Lawrence was already beleaguered in Lucknow, and there was not a native regiment in Oud that could be depended upon. On the 5th of June the crisis came at Cawnpore, and found General Wheeler entrenched in this ill-chosen quarter. All told, he had eleven hundred souls within the limits of his camp. 
less than five hundred were fighting men, and Nana Saib had surrounded the camp with an impenetrable ring of thirty thousand men. Wheeler had thrown up a wall of mud well enough to keep an ill-disciplined rabble out, but no protection against the rain of bullets and the incessant cannonading kept up from the camp of the mutineers. At first he had two buildings which served for partial shelter, not so much from the fire of the enemy as from the deadly heat of the sun, and from the rains which had commenced. These buildings were speedily levelled by Nana Saib's batteries, and there remained for the hapless refugees nothing but the bare ground and the open sky. At the end of three weeks, when hundreds had died and the rest were starving, the crafty Hindu proposed terms of capitulation, which were surprisingly generous. The troops were to march out, stacking their rifles but wearing their side-arms. They were to be escorted to the riverside, where they were to take boat and make the best of their way to Allahabad. The road by which they started on this fatal march is clearly enough marked today. It follows a direct line for the Sooty Ghat, passing under the high road at a short distance from the river. After the rainy season a rivulet finds its way by this course to the Ganges, and it must have been heavy marching for Wheeler's men and the women and children who accompanied them. It is dry enough today, a dusty pathway through an arid plain. The ghat by which the sick and weary company took boat was at that time a busy landing place. At the top of the steps is the little temple and sooty house which gives the ghat its name. Other spots connected with the tragedy have been swept and garnished and are guarded as sacred memorials, but the slaughter gate through which the unsuspecting men and women went to their doom has been left untouched as an accursed thing. The temple is doorless and windowless. The house behind, where a faithful Hindu widow was long time ago, burned with the head of her dead lord on her knee, is crumbling to pieces, and the tomb in which husband and wife lie undivided in death is broken and defaced. The steps of the ghat are half an inch thick with dust, undisturbed by the tread of human foot. The two people trees which witnessed the murder still flourish, and doubtless are green enough after the rains, but just now the leaves are dust-laden and parched, and the grey gnarled trunks lean over towards the river as if they had long been tired of life, and would above all things like to tumble into its cool depths. The place is indescribably lonely and desolate. Standing by the temple, there is plainly in view the bend of the river behind which Nana Saib had hid his guns. A little lower down on the other side of the river lay in ambuscade a regiment of rebels, charged with the duty of slaying all whom the cannon spared. Three boatloads got off, and rowed for a thousand yards in fancied security, and with lightened hearts at the thought that their troubles were now over that no more would they see the terrible camp, with its hunger and thirst, its houselessness, its never-ceasing rain of bullets, and its frequent thunderstorm of artillery. Just round the point the slaughter began. The boats were sunk with cannon-shot, and those who escaped and tried to reach the land were pitilessly shot by the troops on the other side of the river. General Wheeler, some of his officers, and most of the women, had been halted under a tree which still stands eight or nine hundred yards distant from the ghat. When they heard the firing, they knew what had happened, and fled in wild affright along the main road, but the cavalry speedily hunted them down. The men were shot like dogs, and the women and children carried off to Nana Saib's house. Had Wheeler been able to hold out a few days longer, all would have been well. Havelock was already on the march, his nearer approach being made the signal for an episode which is the darkest act in the hurried tragedy. On the eve of going out to give battle to the English general, Nana Saib issued orders for the massacre of the women. They were invited to leave the house under pretense of being conducted to a place of safety. 
but they had had enough of the Hindu's clemency. They refused to move, and were shot by volleys fired through the windows, sepoys entering sword in hand and completing the work. This done, they were dragged out, dead and dying, women and children, and cast into a well that stood opposite the house. There they were found, when Havelock's men, having utterly routed Nana Sahib, entered the town, flushed with the generous hope of rescue. The memorial church stands just outside the entrenchment of Wheeler's camp. It is a substantial rather than a handsome structure, built of red brick faced with sandstone. Round the chancel is a row of memorial tablets, set there, quote, to the glory of God, and in memory of more than a thousand Christian people who met their deaths hard by between the 6th of June and the 15th of July, 1857. As already mentioned, the church is today decorated for the Christmas festival, and over this memorial of massacre there runs a garland proclaiming, with grim but undesigned irony, peace on earth and good will among men near the altar rail is a pretty marble font sent as an offering by the queen as we stood in the church reading the names of the victims of the mutiny we could hear the cheers of the british soldiers in the barracks welcoming their officers who had looked in upon their christmas dinner of roast beef and plum pudding the barracks built since the mutiny stand not far from the house which was Nana Sahib's headquarters at a time when he was treating for the capitulation of a British general, and believed that within twenty-four hours Cawnpore would see the last of the English soldier. The memorial garden is separated from the church by a space big enough to hold the city of Cawnpore, if the people could by any means be induced to dwell in neighbourly fashion. At the time of the mutiny, the well served the needs of a few straggling houses, which in the eccentric disposition of the town happened to find themselves here. Now only a marble cross set in a grass plot, dark in the shadow of solemn yews, marks the site of the butchery, whilst the well itself is a prominent object in a rich and well-ordered garden. When Havelock reached Cawnpore and found this terrible truth at the bottom of the well, it was too late to furnish Christian burial to Nana Sahib's victims. The well was bricked over, and in due time there has risen upon the site a beautiful marble figure, an angel with sad face, yet not sorrowing as those that have no hope, but carrying in either hand the palm of victory. Over the gateway of the enclosure which surrounds this solemn burial place is written, These are they who came out of great tribulation. Round the base of the statue runs the inscription, Sacred to the perpetual memory of a great company of Christian people, chiefly women and children, who near this spot were cruelly massacred by the followers of the rebel Nana Dumdo Punt of Bithwur, and cast the dying with the dead into the well below on the 15th July, 1857. In strange contrast with the scene recalled by these words is the aspect of today. With the sun shining down on bright flowers, green grass and lusty trees, and all around the peace and goodwill of Christmas Day. End of chapter 16。Chapter 17 of East by West, A Journey in the Recess, Volume 2, by Henry W. Lucy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 The Capital of the Great Mogul. I made an acquaintance at Cawnpore, who is too interesting to be altogether lost sight of. We met first in the early morning when I was looking for the post office. There approached from down the road a gary with a human shoulder projecting from either open window and a prodigious arm hanging limp, pensively enjoying the cool morning air. 
the nearer approach of the gary disclosed the upper part of a gigantic man his turban brushed the roof of the gary as he sat and if he had not got his arms outside i cannot conceive where he would have put them as i gazed he nodded in the friendliest way and when i asked if he knew where the post office was he stopped the carriage with effusive politeness he even made as if he would descend but reflection on the difficulties that surrounded his getting back again made him pause as it was he insisted upon shaking me by the hand and so bubbled over with friendship that i felt as if we had known each other for many years his knowledge of english was not more than sufficed with the assistance of gestures to direct me to the post office and after he had shaken hands with me again the patient horse moved off with him i marvelled much who he might be but having no means of learning i had given up the puzzle when i met him once more amid surroundings that deepened the mystery i had obtained the address of the editor of a native paper published in cawnpore and went in quest of him desiring to have a talk on the subject of the ilbert bill and other matters his office was in the native part of the town approached by a street so narrow that driving was inconvenient if not impossible holding the address in my hand i walked down the street a narrow lane flanked with shops a few feet square windowless and doorless native shopkeepers in the street at the top skirting the memorial gardens might if they pleased dress themselves in the borrowed plumes of the english bons la mistre might vaunt his furniture's room and mistry janoji might write himself up couch builder but in this street older by a century than the english occupation natives were content to follow old customs and retain ancient appellations in each shop squatted a man or woman waiting for custom which came but slowly occasionally a child came up and had weighed out to her with infinite carefulness an ounce of ghee fished out of a jar by the impartial finger of the proprietor which was next inserted in whatever other receptacle had a call made upon it now and then a woman bought a few pice worth of rice and the trade in betel nuts was comparatively lively for the rest the dealers sat in their shops gazing into vacancy or talking across the narrow passage to their equally disengaged neighbour on the other side at the corner of a by-street sat an old woman with a few handfuls of parched peas stored in a bit of paper with a little tin measure designed to mete out the luxury to solvent customers as none came the old woman fondled the peas with bony hands not less parched than they arranging and rearranging them with a tireless devotion that must have added sensibly to their flavour perhaps she was hungry herself and thus dallied with an appetite too expensive to be satiated i suppose the market value of the whole stock was one penny and when this was turned over and the first profits gleaned the old lady would have her dinner in the meanwhile she took in sustenance by the pause as joey ladle was accustomed in the recesses of his employer's cellar to take his wine whenever i saw a comparatively well-to-do person i showed him the scrap of paper with the hindu's address on generally he turned it so as to read it sideways and invariably returned it with a deprecatory shake of the head no christian it seems ever penetrates this quarter at last i came to a place with press written over it and showing the paper was directed by sign up a courtyard there were stables outside and at first that seemed all but espying a narrow passage i followed it and came into a courtyard faced by a house of remarkable appearance flanked on either side by outbuildings the house was a cut between a disused gin palace and a show booth it was painted in gaudy colours had glass chandeliers hanging down and was adorned with many mirrors in one corner of the veranda rolled up in a blue and red coverlet was a patriarch fast asleep and there in the centre of the yard sitting upon a low couch some eight feet long by six broad was my mysterious acquaintance of the morning 
he was as delighted to see me as i was surprised at this second rencontre in this out-of-the-way yard in the native quarter his back was turned as i entered and he was gazing reflectively upon a basket of very dirty cakes which shared the couch with him around in different postures all indicative of profoundest respect and veneration were half a dozen men one waving a dirty pocket handkerchief was keeping flies off the too seductive face of the giant a second held in his hand a stock of lime leaves and a third held fast in the damp palm of his swarthy hand a store of small pieces of betel nut from these the mysterious creature on the couch alternately helped himself while he gazed with troubled brow upon the casket of cakes apparently debating with himself whether he should buy a pennyworth but trouble vanished when he saw me the cake man was peremptorily dismissed the other two servitors were waved off and a great fat hand was affectionately pressing mine post office ha huh? he said by way of greeting and that being his available stock of english he shook hands again in his country this essentially absurd ceremony is unknown but he knew englishmen did it and if he could not speak english he could shake hands which he did frequently i sat and talked with him for a time but i could make nothing of him and left without the slightest notion whether he was the hindu editor whom otherwise i never found or whether he was a false prophet or a deposed prince he was certainly taking into account the absence of preliminary acquaintance the friendliest man i ever met Accra, called by the mussulman akbarabad the city of akbar was not always the capital of the great mogul he had begun to build it in fifteen sixty six but four years later a circumstance happened which determined him to move to fatehpur sikri some twenty-four miles distant at this place there lived a holy man named selim christi who foretold the birth of a son to the great emperor the son arrived in due time a remarkable circumstance in early married life which so pleased akbar that he not only called the lad selim after the sheikh but determined to go and reside in the immediate neighbourhood of the holy man agra was projected and partly built but that was a mere trifle in the way of an imperial whim the capital should be at futepur sikri and forthwith the emperor set about building a palace for himself one for his christian wife a row of palaces for his other wives a palace for his prime minister stables a mint a pavilion a council chamber and other marvellous structures the ruins of which stand to this day attesting imperial magnificence and the genius of the native workman but the same personal influence that had caused the creation of the city decreed its desertion selim christie discovered that the pomp and circumstance of the court interfered with his devotions he bore the affliction as long as possible spreading his prayer carpet in quiet places and groaning inwardly in the spirit at length the crisis came the emperor having created this splendid and costly jewel of a town determined to enclose it in a casket of impregnable fortifications then out of the fullness of his heart the holy sheikh spoke my lord he said twenty times has your slave made the pilgrimage to mecca and never amid the heat of the day the weariness of the night or the hunger of the morning was his soul so sorely tempted by worldly things as amid the distractions of this great city which the emperor has created where yesterday was a lonely waste if it be your majesty's will said the emperor that one should go let it i pray you be your slave and thus it was settled the great mogul worthy descendant of timour the tartar invincible in war sagacious in council 
omnipotent conqueror of Hindustan, yielded to the fancy of the soiled and sainted ascetic. The word was given to move on to Agra, and the beautiful palaces, the spacious courtyards, the lofty council chambers, were quitted as promptly as if they had been furnished lodgings. The sheikh regained his solitude, the greater solitude of a deserted city, and when he died was buried here, in a tomb whose floor is jasper, whose walls are marble inlaid with precious stones, whose doors are of solid ebony, and over which rises an arched canopy covered with mother of pearl. A city more or less was nothing to Akbar, absolute master of a hundred million men and of all the riches of India. Having created a splendid city at Fatehpur Sikri, he determined to excel it at Agra and succeeded. His palace, with its many adjuncts, remains to this day in a condition which enables a visitor to realise all the magnificence of the Mughal court. It stands high on the banks of the Jamna, the buildings occupying a space of a mile and a half in circuit, surrounded by a glorious red sandstone wall sixty feet high. In Akbar's time there were outside this battlemented wall a ditch and rampart, these have disappeared, but the inner moat, thirty feet wide, still exists, and the fort is entered by the drawbridge which once resounded to the tread of Akbar's spearmen. In a great courtyard surrounded by arcades, now used as a British arsenal, stands the judgment seat of Akbar. In a recess in the centre of the hall is a pavilion of white marble inlaid with mosaic, where the throne was placed. Below is a large white slab on which the Prime Minister of the hour, they were changed even more frequently than capitals, stood and introduced claimants for justice to the notice of the Emperor. Behind the throne are a series of chambers lighted by windows of trellis work closely cut in marble. Through these, on great occasions when durbars were held, the ladies of the Zanana used to peer forth themselves unseen just as ladies in the House of Commons at this day peep from their cage over the Speaker's chair. This hall has recently been repaired by the Indian government at an expenditure of 8,000 rupees. Close by is the Motel Muzjid, or Gem Mosque, a gem of architecture which would be held as matchless if a mile down the river, clearly seen from the walls of the fort, the white dome of the Taj did not seem to float, a fairy thing, far up in the blue sky. In this mosque, built of pure white marble, Akbar was accustomed to worship in the select company of his many wives. The emperor, the princes of his household, his ministers and chief men of war, spread their prayer rugs on the marble pavement, while the ladies said their prayers behind marble screens, which guarded them from wanton glances. Shah Jihan, grandson of Akbar, was, half a century later, provided with prolonged and exceptional opportunities of conducting his devotions in this mosque. His son, Aurangzebe, having arrived at the conclusion that his father had had enough of sovereignty when he had sat on the throne for nearly a quarter of a century, shut him up in this mosque, and peacefully reigned in his stead. At the back of the Hall of Justice is a corridor in which lies Akbar's marble couch, grievously shattered and clumsily mended as if it were a broken dish. But even in its decrepitude it puts to shame a gilt-backed, cane-seated, British lion-decked, uncomfortable monstrosity which the Nawab of Lucknow presented to the Viceroy when he held a durbar at Agra. The Emperor's palace remains as to its main structure in excellent preservation, but its bejewelled walls have been sadly pecked at by successive hosts of conquerors, notably including the British soldier, who seems to have had a fine eye for jasper, agate, and cornelian, and a deft hand for picking it out with the point of his bayonet. The Indian government, with well-dispensed liberality, have recently wakened up to the value of these priceless possessions, and have not only taken measures to stop further depredations, 
but have begun the work of restoration. For the last five years, two hundred men have been daily employed in restoring the unsightly gaps whence the precious stones have been plundered. Under a better taskmaster than Akbar, these descendants of the early artists labour, cutting out marble with bows strung with fine steel wire, shaping and polishing precious stones, and fitting them into the wall with a nicety which, but for varied colour, would defy discovery of the joining places. The original carving of the pure marble, not being portable or saleable property, has suffered least, and there are suites of rooms containing panels some four feet high, from the rough face of which are carved in relief beautiful flowers which bend their heads with all the graceful repose of the living plant. Even beyond these in beauty are the screens, each one carved out of a solid slab in marble and looking like delicate lacework. Sometimes a whole window is thus wrought, giving glimpses of the jumna which washes the walls of the fort and of the green fields that lie beyond. Often it is an open screen over a doorway, designed to promote the circulation of air, which is one of the chief ends of the house-builders in India. Wherever the screens appear, they are beautiful, beyond possibility of reproduction by modern art, and it is well that so many remain undamaged. In the Diwani Kas, or private audience hall, is another throne of Akbar's, a slab of black marble six feet square. Like his couch, it is cracked right across. At intervals on the line of the crack are two smudged red spots, whereby hangs a tail. When the Maharattas, continuing their triumphant campaign against the Mussulmans, took Agra, the Raja of Bertpore presumptuously seated himself on the throne of the great Mogul, whereupon the shocked marble cracked, and a gout of blood issued from its anguished heart. Many years later, Lord Ellenborough, having conquered the conquerors of the Mogul dynasty, took his seat on the throne, when once more the sensitive marble distilled a huge drop of blood. This satisfactorily accounts for the second stain. Across the broad courtyard is a smaller throne of white marble. Here, according to Mussulman tradition, the emperor's fool was wont to take his seat and mimic his mighty master. It is noteworthy that the jester, with a shrewdness not incompatible with native simplicity, was careful to have his throne well outside the swing of the emperor's scimitar. In this part of the building is the jessamine tower, with bouquets of jessamine carved in relief out of massive blocks of marble. Leading out of it is a court paved with squares of black and white marble so as to form a pachisi board. Pachisi is a game something like backgammon, but in place of ivory pieces, Akbar was wont to engage a number of pretty girls, who stood upon the squares and moved hither and thither at a signal from the players. In this quarter is also the Shish Mahal, a palace of glass, an oriental bath, the marble roof and walls of which are decorated with thousands of bits of looking-glass. In Akbar's time the bath was served with water falling in a broad sheet into a marble basin. Behind the waterfall lamps shone, others blazed amid the fountains, their refracted light gleaming at a thousand points where it caught the miniature mirrors. Leading out of the Zinana apartments is a small square jealously shut in by high walls, here the ladies of the Zinana used to chaffer with happy merchants admitted to show their wares. The garden of the Zinana is, save in respect of lack of care, much the same as it was when the imperial wives walked and gossiped under the shadow of its trees. The centre is divided by stone copings into little squares and ovals, sometimes enclosing a foot or two of earth, and again forming the boundaries of a mimic lake. Here, too, is Mochi Bawan, where Akbar, forgetful of the cares of state and assisted by his favourite wives, 
whiled away the summer afternoon fishing in a tank. Recent excavations carried on in the neighbourhood of the fort have brought to light a number of marble pillars, some broken, others whole, but all preserving the imperishable work of the early sculptor. They lie in a heap in one of the courtyards, there being apparently no settled scheme of dealing with them. Perhaps they might be spared for one of the London parks, as examples of the position which art had reached in India at the time Queen Elizabeth was on the throne of England. Outside Akbar's palace, but still within the circle of the fort, is a palace built by Jehangir, Akbar's son. The passion for palace building was so great among the Mughal emperors that the beautiful house Akbar had built would not serve his successor. He raised one for himself and to his own perpetual glory. Going back for his model to his father's earlier essay at Futtepur Sikri, Jahangir's homestead is built of red sandstone and has in respect of architecture nothing in common with the dainty palace of his great father. Akbar's taste was essentially Mohammedan. Jahangir, a longer settler in the conquered country, made his house a stately monument of native architecture. Not least in interest to the English visitor are the gates of Somnath, which find lodgment in Akbar's palace. They are of sandalwood, finely carved, with the colour deepened and enriched by age. As gates go, they are not massive, being only twelve feet high, and not more than conveniently broad to be passed by a pair of loaded camels marching abreast. On a panel on the left doorway are three metal bosses, said to have been taken from the shield of Sultan Mahmud. It was Lord Ellenborough who lifted the gates of Somnath into a high place in history. My brethren and friends, he wrote in the famous proclamation to the princes and people of India, issued at the close of the Afghan campaign in 1842, our victorious army bears the gates of Somnath in triumph from Afghanistan, and the despoiled tomb of Sultan Mahmud looks upon the ruins of Ghuzni. The insult of eight hundred years is at last avenged. The gates of the temple of Somnath, so long the memorial of your humiliation, are become the proudest record of your national glory the proof of your superiority in arms over the nations beyond the Indus. To you, princes and chiefs of Sir Hind, of Rajivana, of Malwa, and of Gujarat, I shall commit this glorious trophy of successful war. You will yourselves, with all honour, transmit the gates of Sandalwood through your respective territories to the restored temple of Somnath. This remarkable production, which reads like the effort of a schoolboy who had spent his nights and days studying the bulletins of Napoleon I and Macaulay's essay on Warren Hastings, met with a fate which must have astonished as much as it pained the noble author. It was greeted in England with a shout of uncontrollable laughter, the reverberation of which stopped the southward progress of the gates. The princes and chiefs of Sir Hind, of Rajivana and of Malwa hustled them along through their respective territories as quietly as possible. The prince of Gujarat conveniently ignored the proud mission. The gates were stranded at Agra, and now find shelter in the palace of Akbar, surrounded by an iron kitchen area railing of prim, uncompromising pattern, by which Birmingham shows what it can do when placed upon its metal. As for the temple of Somnath, it goes further to ruin without sighing for its sandalwood gates, which, in truth, there is grave reason to doubt ever belonged to it. End of chapter 17「18 of East by West a Journey in the Recess, Volume 2 by Henry W. Lucy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 The Wonder of India The tameness of the common birds in India has been nowhere more strikingly illustrated than in this crowded city. 
on a piece of waste ground skirting one of the main roads a flock of cyrus numbering over half a hundred are daily accustomed to gather and discuss the occupation of egypt the ilbert bill the alleged designs of russia on india and other matters of general interest no one disturbs their consultation no wicked boy throws stones at them nor does any man raise gun to shoot they have their talk out and go their way in search of whatever scraps householders may have provided for them at the hotel many more sparrows than guests sit down to breakfast they fly in by open doors across bedrooms into the dining-room walk about the floor and sometimes alight on the tablecloth helping themselves to crumbs every morning one particularly pert fellow flies into my bedroom perches on the inner window-sill and with shrill voice and mendacious detail tells me he built the taj this is manifestly impossible and is confuted by well-known facts but if contradicted he brings in two or three other fellows who sitting on the bed-rail on the washstand on my portmanteau wherever there is claw-hold back him up with more details creating a shrill clamour from which i am at last glad to make escape before going to see the taj the wonder of india it is advisable to visit the mausoleum of Kwaji Giyas, commonly known as the tomb of Itmudu Daula. This would of itself be worth seeing if it stood one hundred miles distant from the Taj. But the truth is that, after beholding the Taj, nothing of the same kind is worth looking at. Nevertheless, the tomb of Itmud has attractions of its own, and a history excelling in human interest that of many grander places. Kwaji Gias was a soldier of fortune who came from western Tartary in the hope of finding appointment in the service of the great Emperor Akbar. In this he succeeded, but the foundation of his supreme fortunes was laid when his daughter Noor Mahal was born. She grew up in matchless beauty and lit in the breast of the heir apparent that glowing passion the history of which is written in moore's light of the harem she happened to be engaged to sheer afghan one of the nobles of the court and being an exceedingly shrewd person married him a match with the emperor's son seemed more brilliant but in those days it was by no means certain that an heir apparent would reach the throne his very claim might prove fatal to him and if he were poisoned strangled or walled up his wife would be in sore straits sheer afghan on the contrary was in a well-established position not too high to invite hostility and yet high enough to satisfy the reasonable expectations of becky sharp when however jehangir succeeded to the throne of akbar things were changed sheer afghan was got out of the way and his widow otherwise inconsolable married the emperor the new empress immediately began to provide for her relations who at news of her advancement flocked in from tartary her father she caused to be made high treasurer and all her uncles her cousins and her aunts had fat places found for them about the court having no children by jehangir she concentrated her attention upon the advancement of her daughter by the hapless sheer afghan whom she married to a younger son of the emperor as a preliminary towards recovering the throne for him she induced her husband to put out the eyes of his eldest son khosru khosru's mother was naturally indignant at this Noor Mahal invited the lady to her apartments to talk the matter over. Walking round the courtyard, she incidentally asked her visitor to look down a new well that had been dug, and gently but firmly pushed her in. This new family bereavement moved the heart of Shah Jahan, the second son, toward his unfortunate elder brother he went off to a quiet place in the south of india and sent back a messenger to say he could not endure the separation from his poor blind brother 
Cosru, touched by this sympathy, went off to his brother, who embraced him so affectionately that he strangled him. Nor Mahal looked upon this proceeding with approval, since it left only one life between her son-in-law and the throne. Shah Jahan must be removed, and all would be well. But Jahan, as his little comedy with his poor blind brother testified, was both crafty and determined. It became a game of pull devil, pull baker, and Shah Jahan won. Coming to the throne on the death of his father, he put out the eyes of his brother Nur Mahal's son-in-law, impartially strangled all his other blood relations, and cast into prison the dowager empress. Here, through long years, this Catherine of Hindustan ate out her lion-heart, comforted only by the memory of the days when she had been first at the council board, had led the imperial troops into battle, and had caused her name to be struck on the coin issued from the imperial mint, the first and last time till the epoch of Victoria that a woman's name was so honoured in India. Noor Mahal, as will appear from this simple story, was a woman of strong family affection, and it was in obedience to this impulse she built this great mausoleum, Itmud Udaula, for the entombment of her father. She sleeps by his side, life's fitful fever over, only her story left to light up a lurid page in the early history of India. The Taj was built by Shah Jahan. Apart from its architectural beauties, it is the most magnificent tribute ever raised by man to the memory of a dead wife. Jahan had married the niece of the terrible Empress Nur Mahal. Mumtaz e Mahal had inherited much of the beauty of her aunt, and might have developed something of her ambition and unscrupulousness, but Jahan was a stronger man than his father, and had his ideas of the proper place of woman in politics. He would not let his wife meddle with the imperial government, but he loved her very dearly, and when she died resolved that she should have the most magnificent tomb in India. Hence the Taj, by common consent, the tomb, as distinct from all others in the world. Like the fort, the Taj stands on the banks of the Jumna. Seen from its marble terrace, the river, second in sanctity only to the Ganges, presents a strange appearance. Its wide bed is for five-sixths of its extent dry land, the enfeebled current running through a narrow channel on the other side. Under the walls of the Taj, a great field of wheat is growing among the grey sandbanks in the very middle of the river bed. When the rains come in June, the newly born river will rush downward in a mighty stream, washing high up the walls of the Taj, and the cornfield will lie some fathoms deep. In the meanwhile, the harvest will be garnered in and when next autumn the river dries up again, a rich bed will be ready to receive the sowing for a new harvest. I suppose there is no other instance of a river so rich in gifts as this, to give fish at its flood and corn at its ebb. Like the minarets at Benares, the Taj dominates the city. Its white domes are seen almost from every point of view. It is approached through a magnificent gateway built of red sandstone, elaborately carved and eloquent with sentences from the Koran. At the end of an avenue of dark cypress trees, the Taj reveals itself. It is built of white marble, raised upon a platform of red sandstone, the marble as purely white today as when it was polished. The building realises to a great extent the structure of the new Jerusalem, which John in his dream at Patmos beheld when the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The great city, whose quote, foundations were garnished with all manner of precious stones, end quote. the first a jasper and the twelfth an amethyst. The uttermost ends of the earth were put under tribute to furnish building materials to the Taj. Jaipur sent white marble, 
the rare yellow marble came from the banks of the Nair Buddha, and the black from Charco. China contributed the crystal, the Punjab sent jasper, the cornelian came from Baghdad, turquoises from Tibet, and agate from Yemen. Ceylon loaded the emperor's commissioners with lapis lazuli, the Red Sea was dragged for coral, Bundelkund sent garnets, Puna produced its diamonds, Nerbuddha sent rock spa, Marchin yielded its famous philosopher's stone, Gwalior paid tribute in lodestone, Vilayet in chalcedony, Lanka in sapphires, whilst Persia presented onyx and amethyst to her powerful neighbour. This rare wealth of precious stones is disposed over the marble with infinite skill and artistic taste. Where the marble ends and the inlaying begins is to be told only by the varied colour. Happily the Taj has escaped the fate of the palaces within the fort. The British soldier, flushed with victory and animated by extra rations of grog and newborn love of art, has not come poking round the walls with point of bayonet, nor has the jart swooped down on the place, nor the Maharatta overrun it. It is as perfect as when Noor Jahan was laid here, and looking upon its perfectness, Shah Jahan conceived the notion of building a similar mausoleum on the other side of the river, connecting the two by a silver bridge. The grave of the beautiful Noor Jahan is dug in a vault underneath the level floor by which access is obtained to the cenotaph. A flight of marble steps leads to the solemn gloom of the chamber, the light falling like dim break of day, full on the end of the tomb bearing the inscription of the Empress's name. This is the crowning beauty of the idea of the immortal architect, the chamber all gloom, and only the name of the dead wife illumined by the soft daylight struggling down the staircase. Whilst we were enjoying the beauty of the inlaid work, easily enough distinguished when the eye grows accustomed to the half-light of the chamber, there came bustling down the steps an anna-touting intruder with a lantern, whose vulgar farthing light he shed upon the inscription of the tomb, and proposed to carry round the chamber so that we might rub our noses against the masterpieces of the nameless artists. He was a sepoy, and I confess to finding it difficult to repress the wish that he had died during the mutiny. He and a worthy colleague with another lantern were fluttering around the upper chamber when we arrived, pestering visitors to note this and that to be seen only with their lantern, and taking all the graciousness out of the place. The authorities who take such infinite care of the Taj should confer a last favour upon the public by having these obnoxious pests removed. Shah Jahan never began his mausoleum on the other side of the river, wanting too early a tomb for himself. He was laid by the side of his lost bride, the tomb being magnificent enough even for emperor. It stands on the left-hand side, leaving Noor Jahan's undisturbed in the centre, and bears an inscription of which the following is a rough translation. Quote, the magnificent tomb of the king, inhabitant of the two heavens, Riddevan and Kool, the most sublime sitter on the throne in the starry heavens, dweller in paradise, Shah Jahan Bad Shah Ghazi. Peace to his remains, heaven is for him. His death took place the twenty-sixth day of Rujub, in the year 1076 of the Hijri, A.D. 1665. From this transitory world, eternity has marched him off to the next. End quote. Each grave is covered by an immense block of marble, exquisitely inlaid. A marble screen, carved so delicately that it looks like a web of lacework, encircles the cenotaphs that stand in the centre of the marble hall above the vault. The walls of this larger chamber are inlaid to the roof, which rises in a dome above the cenotaphs. This marble dome possesses, amidst other beauties, the most melodious echo ever heard. 
a single note sung below it is repeated as if by an angelic choir dying away in the faintest far-off trill the building of the taj occupied twenty thousand workmen twenty-two years and cost three millions sterling even in the age when there were no trades unions and no possibility of strikes some details are preserved in a persian manuscript of contemporary date the yellow marble cost four pounds per square yard the black marble cost nine pounds the crystal fifty seven pounds the lapis lazuli one hundred and fifteen pounds whatever might have been the wages of the workmen the masters of art were paid on an imperial scale considering the value of the money at that date the overseer was paid at the rate of one hundred pounds a month a similar wage being allotted to the chief illuminator and the master mason it is perhaps interesting to add that the platform of red sandstone on which the taj stands measures nine hundred and sixty four by three hundred and twenty nine feet that the terrace of white marble built on this platform and from which the beautiful structure rises is three hundred and thirteen feet square that the roof is uplifted seventy feet from the terrace that the dome seventy feet in diameter is one hundred and twenty feet high and that the gilt crescent which surmounts the dome is two hundred and sixty feet from the ground the perfection of the architect's art is told in the fact that one looking upon the building does not think whether it is large or small or of any geometrical shape it is simply perfect something to be seen not once but a hundred times in all the varied aspects of weather and hour it is a chameleon among architectural works in the early morning whilst dawn is breaking it seems coloured a light blue rose-tinted beneath the rising sun dazzling white at noontide violet colour before an impending storm crimson at sunset pearly white under the moonlight always a thing of beauty a joy for ever end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of east by west a journey in the recess volume two by henry w lucy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen delhi waiting for the train at agra hanging with hindus and moslems on the bridge i saw a sight doubtless familiar enough in this ancient stronghold of the mohammedan faith but fresh and marvellous to western eyes as the train drew up there poured from it the incessant stream of third-class passengers which coming and going is the fount of the wealth of indian railways when the stream began to fail four men carrying two kangos chairs approached the end compartment of a third-class carriage out of which was projected the head of a grim old man becomingly attired in white turban and flowing robe of bright pea-green the old gentleman got out when the coolies came up and a great white sheet was produced this was carefully elevated so as to touch the top of the carriage the lower end draping the chairs and hiding them from view the old gentleman who had been hovering around the group cackling like an old hen whose chickens were giving her trouble now disappeared behind the sheet which was violently agitated from within there was certainly some one there and underneath the lowest fold of the sheet i caught sight of a bare foot which was a great deal too small to belong to the old gentleman after the space of a moment the sheet was withdrawn and presto there was no one there but the old gentleman looking heated and flurried whilst i was watching this native conjurer the coolies picked up the two kangos which were jealously closed in with red cloth and rapidly moved off the old gentleman hitching up his pea-green gown and hobbling after them the furrows on his face visibly deepening as he made his way through the crowd his eyes fixed upon the coolies and their presumably precious burdens 
when he had seen them clear out of the station the indefatigable old gentleman trotted back to the carriage and getting in shut the door after him the compartment was hidden from the view of other occupants of the carriage by means of a black cloth fastened across the open ironwork that divides third-class carriages on the indian railways but i caught a glimpse of him from the outside and noticed that he seemed to be occupied in making up a parcel of clothing he had one of the large bed quilts without which no native travels in this winter weather and was hurriedly tying it around something he opened the door and the bedclothes began to move clumsily making the descent from the carriage to the platform then it was clear enough that the bundle was a woman possibly a young woman certainly not a small one with the bed quilt pulled over her face and her body bent nearly double she ambled off by the side of the old gentleman disappearing up the staircase where doubtless a kango awaited her in the haste of covering her up too much of the bed quilt had been appropriated to her head and as she bent forward there was disclosed a vista of loosely made trousers draggling down to the heel i wish the old gentleman could have been made aware of this i should like to have seen his expressive countenance when he made the discovery but he was too much occupied in getting a third wife out of a crowded station and went on a little ahead all unknowing delhi is a striking illustration of the passion for building which possessed the mogul emperors there is one delhi too well known to the british nation who in eighteen fifty seven watched with bated breath the movements of the little band of eight thousand men who made believe to be besieging the town with its army of thirty thousand rebels armed and desperate but known to history there is not one delhi but forty-five square miles of delhis the advantages of the site on which the present city stands were always clear to the old city builders but sometimes because delhi had been rooted up by an invader even oftener because the reigning emperor desired to associate his own name with the city delhi was always being rebuilt somewhere within a square of forty-five miles the present city was built by shah jehan about the middle of the seventeenth century five and a half miles are enclosed within its ramparts of red granite battlemented and turreted it has twelve gates the name of one the kashmir gate being imperishable as long as english history shall be told of the ancient delhis there remain only ruins the best known surrounding the kutub minar the loftiest column in the world at the present time it stands two hundred and forty feet high tapering from a base of fifty feet in diameter to a summit of thirteen feet when first built it stood sixty feet higher its form is peculiar being divided by heavy balconies into seven stories the first three being of red sandstone and the last two of white marble six bands carrying inscriptions encircle the basement story of the tower some of them contain passages from the koran others hymn the praises of successive sultans who built the tower or from time to time repaired it like agra delhi has its fort enclosing the palace of the emperor it extends for a mile along the bank of the jumna and is a mile and a half in circuit on the three sides facing the town there rises a wall of red sandstone forty feet high flanked with turrets and cupolas the palace has suffered more grievously than those at agra shah jehan made the place too tempting for the times in which he lived ah gott blucher whispered as he looked round upon london driven through it as an honoured guest after the peace which followed on waterloo what a place to loot the thoughts of neighbouring kings turned with equal tenderness toward delhi when they heard of the treasures with which shah jehan had loaded it there was the peacock throne six feet long and four feet broad of solid gold inlaid with precious stones twelve pillars of gold supported the canopy wrought of the same precious metal and trimmed with a deep fringe of pearls 
On each side of the throne stood two umbrellas, beside which King Coffee's sunshade was a worthless rag. Shah Jahan's umbrellas, symbols of his imperial state, were made of crimson velvet, royally embroidered with gold thread and pearls, with handles eight feet long of solid gold flashing with diamonds. In the rainy season a stout seven-and-sixpenny gingham would have been of more use. But these umbrellas had attractions of their own, which proved irresistible to the Persian Nadir Shah, who swooped down on Delhi, rolled up the umbrellas and took them off to Tehran, together with the peacock throne, with its back cunningly wrought in jewels so as to represent an outspread peacock's tail. The throne itself, not to mention the umbrellas, was worth six million sterling to the Persian. He was so well satisfied that he did not too carefully strip the palace, and when in later years the Maharattas took their turn, they found, amongst other things, the silver filigree ceiling of the throne room, which they melted down into a block of silver worth a hundred and seventy thousand pounds. Of these barbaric splendours there is scarcely any trace left. Of the peacock's throne there remains only the marble block on which its glories were uplifted. The audience chamber, a square marble pavilion, was transformed into a ballroom when the Prince of Wales visited Delhi, and fountains plashed, flowers bloomed, and gay company gathered as they had been wont to do in the time of Shah Jahan. But that was an accidental and unrepeated reflection of glories dead and gone. Leading out of the hall is a fine room with a balcony, on which Aurangzebe was wont to take his pipe and his ease, and watch the elephants fight on the bank of the Jumna, which runs below. Here also is the Zinana, used as the mess-room of the twelfth, after Delhi was stormed. There is an underground passage of plain stone steps, by which the last king of Delhi, an Indian Mr. Smith, without the umbrella, fled when the Kashmir gate was blown in. Less fortunate than Louis Philippe, Bahadur Shah was caught by Major Hodson when he had got as far as the tomb of the Emperor Humayun, and sent a prisoner to Rangoon. The Turkish bath is not the least beautiful structure in the palace. The walls are charmingly inlaid, the pavement being formed of plaques of plain marble, the joinings so skilfully hidden with inlaying of bloodstone, black marble and yellow, that the floor seems one massive block. In 1857, after the storming of Delhi, the palace was used as barracks for the British soldier, who, having leisure and bayonet points ready, pursued that search for the beautiful alluded to at Agra and elsewhere. So diligent was the pursuit, and so indiscriminate the choice, that wide spaces of wall have been reduced to patchwork, great gaps showing where precious stones had shone. The ceilings have been whitewashed, doubtless during the occupation of the place as a barrack, but here and there glimpses of the old paint and gilding are caught. One specialty about the palace is the occasional plaques of marble, so thin that the sunlight suffuses it from without as if it were horn. Another is the mosaic in precious stones, representing flowers, fruits, birds, and beasts. This decoration was lavished on the hall of public audience, where sat the Mughal kings in the days of their greatness. This spot was greatly affected by that free-handed patron of art, the British soldier, and when he marched out of Delhi, after saving the empire, the walls of the audience chamber looked as if they were recovering from a severe attack of smallpox. This hall is now being repaired. The throne on which the kings of Delhi sat whilst giving public audience faces an open court, looking out upon what is now a tree-grown park, but was, at the time of the mutiny, crowded with native houses spread out at the feet of the monarch, as was the custom wherever a palace was reared. The panels of marble covering the block on which the throne rests are amongst the finest carvings I have seen. 
each carries alternately a lily and a sunflower of great growth and exquisite grace the big heads droop as naturally as if they grew in garden mould instead of sprouting in adamantine marble an ugly iron railing of the kitchen area order surrounds the base of the throne why is it padlocked i asked the guide the canteen's close by he explained british soldier gets wines then when tight comes and smashes stones the authorities check this misdirected energy by means of lofty railings and the soldier if he feels like smashing things after getting wines must needs knock his knuckles against the iron bars with a fine disregard of historical and art associations one barrack canteen is really situated close by the throne and beer-stained tables are spread where moslems used to hold forth their hands to mogul majesty the canteen displays a sort of timetable so curious that i took a copy it runs thus the lines being set forth after the fashion of a railway timetable extra beer eight till nine a m dinner beer twelve to twelve forty five first half dram four thirty to five thirty extra beer five thirty to six thirty evening beer six thirty to seven thirty second half dram seven forty five to eight fourteen thus is the british soldier's day portioned out by a kind of beery dial face at eight o'clock his day begins with the possibility of extra beer and at eight fourteen sharp it closes night and dullness fall illumined only by the reflection that half a dram is better than no drink across the greensward within view of the throne is a venerable people tree which like others of its kind was selected during the mutiny as the scene of an infamous act here fifty-three english women and children were put to the sword with old bahadur shah last and most impotent of the mogul emperors sitting on his jewelled throne and congratulating himself upon the return of the olden times when he was something more than a shadowy monarch surrounded by a mock court a little later another people tree a larger one in the centre of the city near the police court bore fruit of another kind here after the city was stormed two hundred and fifty mutineers taken with arms in their hands were strung up by the neck half a dozen on a bough till the stalwart tree bent under the weight of this unwonted harvest not far from the palace is the juma musjid counted the most beautiful mosque in india it stands in a court four hundred and fifty feet square paved with red stone and approached by handsome gates of sandstone in the centre is a marble basin full of water in which the pious moslem laves his feet before entering the holy place the mosque is of immense size surmounted by three cupolas of white marble each crowned with spires of copper richly gilt two minarets a hundred and thirty feet high flank it on either side from these a splendid view is obtained of delhi and of the ruins which for miles around mark the site of the earlier cities the interior of the mosque is paved with slabs of white marble each decorated with a black border some eighteen hundred worshippers kneel at prayer here and in the palmy days of mohammedanism fifty thousand more stood outside and joined in the service there is to this day on the top of the flight of steps leading into the courtyard and immediately facing the Qibla and Mecca a watch-tower on which two mullahs stood and signalled to the mighty multitude outside the progress of the service. A hand uplifted and the great congregation knew, though they could neither see nor hear, that the priest was reading. Both hands raised and they fell upon their knees with heads bowed to the ground knowing that the priest was praying there are still sufficient moslems in delhi to form a congregation for the mosque on fridays but the multitude in the courtyard has passed out never to return in place of this magnificent and imposing demonstration 
Moslemism has now nothing to show but a few relics kept in a hut in a corner of the courtyard, and producible for the inspection of the unbeliever upon the jingling of the invincible Anna. As usual, there are two men in charge of the show, one who displays the wares, and the other who stands by doing nothing and asks for bakshish after the first has been paid. The old Mussulman, diving into the recesses of the hut, produces a copy of the Koran, which he affirms is thirteen hundred years old, and which he handles with a lack of reverence that sets the unbeliever at his ease. The precious volume is contained in a shabby green velvet box, much the worse for constant handling. There is, in another equally shabby box of tawdry green velvet, a portion of the Koran writ by the hand of Mahomet's grandson. King Tamerlane, the showman says, brought these precious things from Medina. Even of more absorbing interest is a red hair shown under glass in a mean little tin box, and looking at first sight like a cutting of stout thread. This is a hair from the beard of Mahomet, miraculously preserved through all these centuries. In another box is a stone with four very decided toe marks. This is the impress of Mahomet's foot. Looking at this bit of marble and its deep imprint gravely held out to view by the hoary Mussulman in charge, it is borne in upon one that the Prophet was not a man in whose way it would be safe to stand. The hut in which these relics are kept is something like the dark room of a photographer, a similitude strengthened by the hasty manner in which the old Mussulman dives in, brings a relic out to the daylight, and when it has been duly examined, disappears in search of a second one. On a rail in front of the shed were tied bits of string and scraps of red and blue rag. These, it was explained, were the mementos of pilgrims who had brought to the feet of the Prophet special petitions. In the event of their being granted, the faithful Moslem returned, took away his rag, leaving a flower for the Prophet, and a few coppers for the keeper of the Prophet's hair and toe marks, a practice singularly akin to that noted at the temple of Nikko, where men and women brought petitions to Buddha, written on scraps of paper which they left on a string before his altar. As in Japan, I noted that there was an accumulation of these scraps, showing a gathering store of unfulfilled desire. The Kashmir Gate still stands, its walls broken with cannonball, and a tablet recording the names of the six English and five natives who blew it up. Through its shattered framework Nicholson led the storming party, and it is easy to trace his way through the narrow streets in which, fighting hand to hand with the mutineers, and falling in scores under the fire poured upon them from windows and roofs of houses, the little band made its way. Their object was to reach the Kabul gate, where a rebel battery still harassed the besiegers. The young general, a conspicuous object on horseback, rode sword in hand at the head of his men, and had driven the rebels a few paces past the entry to the troublesome battery, when a shot, fired from a mosque hard by, brought him down. The mosque has been angrily demolished, but a plain tablet let into the city wall marks the place where the hero fell. Nicholson sleeps in a shady cemetery overlooking the city where he completed his deathless fame and where he fell in the hour of victory and in the earliest prime of manhood. End of chapter 19「Chapter 20 of East by West, A Journey in the Recess, Volume 2, by Henry W. Lucy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 – An Elephant Ride Jaipur is perhaps the prettiest town in India, as its men are certainly the handsomest. There is none of the manifold races of India, not excepting the Sikhs, which has a prouder history than the Rajputs. They date their ancestry back to the sun god, the Hindu Apollo, whose ideal type of manly beauty is well preserved in his descendants of today. 
to be six feet high is the normal condition of manhood in jaipur and it would not be difficult for the rajah if he were so minded to have a bodyguard of giants averaging six feet four the rajputs have always been soldiers from the time they came down a scythian horde and swarmed over the himalayas to take possession of the fertile plains they were ever a thorn in the side of the mogul conquerors akbar attracted by their chivalry made friends with them and they gladly did battle for him but they were always at war with the proselytizing meddlesome aurangzeb and took their full share in bringing about the dismemberment of the mogul empire whilst the great majority of the native states of india have been merged in the british empire rajputana still maintains a kind of complementary independence and lodges its sovereign prince in royal state at jaipur though there is no more fighting to be done afghans persians moslems and maharattas all being gathered into the british fold where the lion lies down with the lamb the rajput still carries his sword driving about the outskirts of jaipur we did not find a single man unarmed the common labourers weighed down with burdens they carried to and from the city always found a loose hand for their sword a good serviceable weapon with a small hilt capable of being firmly gripped they were not content to sling the sword to their belt but carried it in their hand as if peradventure an enemy lurked at the next turning jaipur stands upon a plain surrounded by hills grateful to the eyes wearied with the level stretch of country from benares to delhi the streets are unusually wide and full of life and colour strange to say the women are not handsome above the average the type of beauty being retained only in the male line but they are graceful in figure and delight in gay colours as elsewhere in india daily life is carried on out of doors the broad long streets lending fuller effect to the picturesque scene jaipur is a great agricultural centre and along the pavement are strewn heaps of grain of beautiful colours from soft greens to golden yellows it is not likely that they were spread there with aesthetic purpose but nobody seemed to buy and they made a rarely beautiful street decoration dyeing is a great business in jaipur the cloths orange rose colour pale green yellow and deep crimson are of course dried out of doors as they come from the dyer's hands the women kind of the family take them up spread them out at full length and wave them hither and thither in the summer air to dry glancing down the street and seeing a dozen groups thus engaged it looks like some graceful scarf dance which the women are engaged in out of sheer idleness love of bright colours and of languorous movement through the throng in the broad streets glide troops of camels of a much finer breed than we have been accustomed to see they move forward with head well up lower lip dropped and eyes cast down under half-closed lids imparting to their visage a comical don't know ya air camels do the principal porterage of jaipur but there are also in use a remarkably fine breed of oxen standing fully sixteen hands high former mahomedan supremacy has left its trace in the considerable sprinkling of moslem women to be met with in the streets these are recognisable by their dress the principal article of which is a pair of trousers tight from knee to ankle but otherwise loosely made superinducing an uneasy feeling that they are gradually coming down the rajput women of hindu faith dress much more than their sisters in bombay in that populous city the garb of the women is based on the model of miss nelly farren's favourite costume in gaiety burlesque a strip of cloth wound round the waist and probably reaching the feet when hanging loose is caught up between the legs and fastened in waistband at the back leaving the swarthy limbs exposed downward from above the knee the dress is indeed much the same as the coolies wear and is contrived in the same dexterous fashion out of a single straight length of cloth 
the rajput women wear full petticoats coming down to their ankles affording endless opportunity for display of colour they sit on the pavement weaving cloth with a simple wheel and a little basket aglow with the colour of many threads one of the commonest sights is two women grinding at a mill quote, as they were in the days of no and so shall be at the coming of the son of man when one shall be taken and the other left End quote. the palace of the maharaja is situated upon the outskirts of the town farthest removed from the railway it is a poor place a kind of lowther arcade furnished from tottenham court road of late years the maharaja has built his soul a lordly dwelling-place which is if possible worse than the older wing it is a lofty white building all bay windows and balconies apparently built in emulation of a modern hotel at margate on the sea there is nothing in india more pitiful than these ill-disciplined endeavours of historic princes to graft european furniture upon oriental life the place swarms with retainers who parcel out visitors among themselves in too ingenious fashion one solemnly conducts the visitor to the billiard-room fancy visiting the home of the lineal descendant of the sun-god to be shown a billiard-room with cues markers shaded lights and benches round the walls as may be found and enjoyed in an english hotel having steeped his soul in barbaric splendour of the slate table and shaded his eyes from the oriental glamour of the cues the stranger is handed over to another attendant who takes him to a reception room with furniture tottenham court road massed in the centre as if there had been a ball yesterday or were to be won to-night there was a third attendant whose special preserve was a drawing-room with axminster carpets on the floor glass chandeliers pendant from the ceiling a marble console table some bow-legged chairs and many mirrors i looked in at the door turned and fled with the three attendants after me each demanding backsheesh passing through a courtyard i saw a group of men squatted on the pavement who broke the horrid nightmare and relieved the place from the aspersion of an ambitiously genteel furnished lodging-house all wore flowing robes crowned with turbans of many colours they were playing a game something like draughts except that the chessboard made of embroidered cloth was shaped like a maltese cross four men played a dozen looked on before a player made a move he threw over one limb of the cross three oblong shaped dice i could not get any inkling of the game but an essential part of it evidently was that each time the dice was thrown the assembled company players and spectators must proceed to conduct themselves as if murder were imminent faces grew black as thunder eyes flashed under beetling turbans frantic gesticulations were made with both hands and everybody shouted at the top of his voice the storm ceased as suddenly as it had commenced and amid dead silence the man who had thrown the dice moved one of the counters on the cloth then the next man took up the dice threw them over a limb of the cross and once more murder was the matter this alternation of riot and silence proceeded with unvaried regularity during the ten minutes i stood and watched but nobody was killed the outbreaks prolonged the game but added zest jaipur like delhi has its half-ruined and deserted palaces in earlier days when the rajputs were always on the warpath their sovereign lived in a half palace half fortress perched on a rock some six miles out of the present capital a m b e r pronounced ambir is to be approached with convenience only on an elephant the hill on which it stands being too steep for carriage traffic the maharaja courteously placed an elephant at our disposal the rendezvous being fixed for a spot four miles out of the town where the steep ascent begins 
driving through the town evidence of the lofty scorn of the rajput for the so-called triumphs of civilization was amusingly displayed on a wall some local artists had drawn nearly life-size an animated group in the near foreground was an express train running at full speed in the air overhead perspective not having entered into the study of the artist was an elephant with four men in the howdah the elephant was passing along vent à terre and was easily beating the express train elephant first the rest nowhere was the motto unwritten but expressed of this spirited drawing it was in this street that later in the day i came upon an artist in sweetmeats he was modelling out of a kind of toffee various figures chiefly native but he had gone further afield and produced an englishman unmistakably recognisable by the bottle held in his right hand a pipe in his left and a maudling look on his face the way to ambir after we had passed through the broad street set at right angles like an american town lay along sandy roads cactus bordered and for the most part under the shadow of great trees on the right was a range of hills crowned with white-walled castles we met processions of women walking into the town carrying on their heads loads of fuel composed chiefly of dung which would have been better disposed of if dug into the land it is their poverty not their will consents fuel is scarce and dear and this artificial compost serves its purpose we saw on the hillside men and women engaged in its preparation spreading it out to dry in the sun we passed our elephant on the way from the palace grunting discontentedly at this necessity for turning out in broiling midday to compliment the foreigner further acquaintance confirmed the opinion of his strong individuality he knelt down at the signal from his driver and we climbed up on his back by a ladder there was no partially enclosed and canopied howdah as is represented in popular pictures of elephant riding only a kind of pack saddle whereon we sat sideways with feet dangling down and full opportunity of slipping off this is the usual way of riding in this district the elephant furnishing the outside car of india our elephant was rather artistically got up both his forehead and the enormous flaps of his ears being painted in blue and red patterns the motion was by no means pleasant under the hot sun there was never any mistake when he put his foot down i found that to begin with half an hour of an elephant is enough but our journey there and back involved a ride of an hour and a half the elephant had brought with him a copious supply of water which he tanked somewhere in his stupendous chops every ten minutes or oftener if he met a camel he inserted his trunk in the reservoir and brought out about a gallon of water with which waving his trunk to and fro he splashed his chest and the front of his forelegs a refreshing gust of spray rising up for the delectation of his fare we met many camels which involved lavish draughts on the reservoir but it was equal to the calls upon it and certainly lasted all the way back the camels were terribly afraid of the monster the supreme don't know ya air with which they passed through the town being changed at sight of the elephant for one that may be described as rather not know ya they invariably halted and cringed up to the hedge at the side of the road as hindus fresh from bathing in the ganges flatten themselves against the wall when a christian passes some of them sobbed in their fright as for the elephant he vastly enjoyed himself grunting with terrible import and emptying his tank with increased energy as the camel's knees shook and their piteous sighs broke forth i believe it was all a joke and that he liked to frighten them enjoying the spectacle of their abject terror the driver sat astride the elephant's neck 
armed with a kind of kitchen poker hooked at one end pointed at the other when the elephant became too demonstrative this poker was brought down on his skull with resounding whack did a leaf fall thor murmured drowsily turning over on his side when the earthly giant catching the god asleep smote him on his forehead with a bludgeon wielded with all his strength when the kitchen poker came down on the elephant's skull his snorting and watering were interrupted by a moment of reflection he seemed to come to the conclusion that a twig had fallen on his head of itself not much but it might presage the tumbling of a whole branch he therefore concluded to be quiet and watch but as certain as a camel appeared his propensity for practical joking overcame his caution there was more grunting a fresh shower renewed terror among the camels then more kitchen poker and the reascendancy of caution after climbing some distance over a hilly road sometimes provokingly dropped down on the other side of a crest we came to the outskirts of the deserted city the Futipur Sikri of the Rajas of Jaipur. The houses are for the most part lofty and commodious, rather palaces than hovels. They are partly inhabited by families who do not seem of the class able to pay rent. It is a steep climb to the castle through narrow, tortuous streets, overshadowed by people trees, from the boughs of which monkeys jabbered at us as we passed. There is nothing specially beautiful about the palace except its situation. It stands on a crest girdled with ruin-crowned hills. From the terrace there is a view through a gap showing a far-away plain all yellow in the sunlight. Within, the principal treasures are a fine pair of brass gates, some brass-bound oak doors, and some good carving of marble but ambir should certainly be visited before agra when we came down into the courtyard to remount our steed we discovered him under the shade of a mighty people tree such as that under which buddha sat and endured the pangs of his spiritual second birth the driver giving him the signal to advance he suddenly uplifted his trunk wound it round a stout bough of the tree and tore it off as if it were a leaf down came the kitchen poker but the elephant would move only at his own pace which was encumbered by the necessity of holding the bough under his foot whilst he tore off with his trunk the succulent green leaves we accomplished the return journey in safety and bade farewell to the elephant at the point where the carriage was waiting to take us back to jaipur as he ponderously moved off there was something in the back view of his hind legs irresistibly reminiscent of major o'gorman once member for waterford walking out of the house of commons to vote against the government End of chapter twenty Chapter twenty one of East by West A Journey in the Recess, Volume two by Henry W. Lucy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty one Out of the Hurly Burly. It was close upon midnight when we reached Ajmir, the last halting stage on the return journey to Bombay. It was some consolation to know that the Dork bungalow where we were to stay was just over the way from the station these dork bungalows are an institution peculiar to a condition of things rapidly passing away in india they are in their way identical with the refuges sprinkled over the bleak passes of the alps the structure is created by the government who at more frequented stations place a khan saman or caterer who supplies food at charges subject to the supervision of the district committee in out-of-the-way places the dork bungalow is simply a shed as comfortless as any in alpine passes it had not hitherto come in our way to stop at a dork bungalow and hearing that there was an exceptionally good one at ajmere we decided to go there the room into which we were shown was plain 
but sufficiently comfortable for a traveller's rest. The lofty walls were recently whitewashed, there was a spacious bathroom, and the bedroom was furnished with a few chairs, a table, and a small truckle bed in the corner. There were neither sheets, blankets, nor quilt on the bed, but the man who had disappeared after showing us into the room had doubtless gone in search of them. After waiting a reasonable time, I went to hurry him up, and made the pleasing discovery that sheets, blankets, and counterpanes do not enter into the domestic economy of a dork bungalow. We had omitted in packing up for our journey to put in a feather bed, a blanket or two, and a change of sheets, and the prospect for the night was not attractive. It was varied by the appearance on the scene of a boisterous Briton, a fellow lodger, who, hearing of our dilemma, literally broke into the room, dragging his bedclothes with him, and insisting upon our accepting the loan. I weakly protested, but he stormed so, declaring in typhonic manner that he could not lie in his bed and know that a lady was without sheets, that there was no help for it. The matter settled by his insistence, he left his bedclothes, and disappeared down the passage like a gale of wind blowing itself out to the southward. Ajmer is not one of the show-places of India, lying out of the hurly-burly of trade, and having nothing well advertised in the way of tombs and temples, but it is, in its quiet way, a singularly interesting exemplar of native life. Moreover, it has its Hindu temple and its Moslem mosque, both of hoar antiquity. The temple is known to the Hindus as Arai Dinka Jopra, which, being translated, means the work of two days and a half. The story is that the king, one of the old rajas of Rajputana, projecting a journey to his residence on a hill overlooking the town, gave orders for the building of a temple, mentioning by the way that he would be back on the third day, and that he expected to find the work complete. He went off, returned in sixty hours, and the temple was ready for service. This fact, strange in itself, becomes even more amazing reflected upon among the ruins of the temple, and taking note of the enormous labour that must have been expended on its construction. There remain now only the brick wall and the roof, supported by red sandstone pillars. These are exquisitely and elaborately carved. Some recent excavations, accidentally conducted, have brought to light a number of slabs of stone covered with inscriptions, which, as far as I could gather from inquiries on the spot, no one has attempted to decipher. In the main street stands the mosque, in much better preservation and in daily use by the faithful, who form a considerable proportion of the population of Ajmer. The mosque was founded in the early days of the Mughal Empire by Kaja Sindh, the first missionary to the heathen Hindu of Ajmer. We have visited many mosques in India without let or hindrance, and were taken aback when, on proposing to enter this building, a Mussulman with ferocious beard and imaginary scimitar in his hand waved us back. The barber is one of the luxuries of European residence or travel in India. He is innumerable and ubiquitous. On arrival at a station after an all-night journey, he is sure to be waiting, and will enter the carriage and shave you without troubling you to move from your seat. At the hotels he knocks timidly at the door as soon as he conceives time has been allowed for the consumption of Chota Hazri, will patiently wait half an hour or an hour, and thankfully takes his threepence, conscious that it is eight times as much as he would get from a native, whilst Saib is not exigeant in the matter of nostrils and ears, and would even be angry if he laid waste a square inch or so on the crown of his head. It was curious, as we strolled about, to find the dogs barking at us. One suddenly coming upon us would stand and gaze for a moment, marvelling at the strange thing, and then, first observing the precaution of sidling out of the way, begin to bark, 
others coming out to see what was the matter and being equally disturbed in their mind took up the cry till matters began to grow exciting we came upon a shoemaker sitting full in the sun by the dusty roadside with the forlornest agglomeration of wrecked boots and shoes ever seen off a dust heap he was gazing upon the mouldy mass of soulless uppers and earthquake rent soles a picture of despondency a possible customer coming along he brightened up and in a long and animated speech appeared to be demonstrating that though eccentric in appearance these were the kind of shoes which with judicious mending were warranted to carry a man on to fortune boot making and boot mending a poor trade generally throughout india is brisker in ajmer where the men are much more given to wearing boots than is the rule women here as elsewhere invariably go barefooted shoes used by a native must necessarily be a size too large since their career is a constant alternation of slipping off and shuffling on no native enters a room or shop with his shoes on driving out to the gardens we came upon a gang of road makers the process of mending the ajmer roads is peculiar a strip about six feet wide is formed in the centre with a mixture of hard clay and gravel when it is level it is beaten down and makes an admirable road for light traffic the outer edges get whatever may be left a gang of ten men were beating the road with rammers they stood in double line five facing five one line retiring and the other advancing as they moved they chanted in quick time a refrain which phonetically rendered reads siddly hum siddly hum the rammers being brought down altogether at the hum women brought in baskets carried on their heads the road material which they flung down as it was wanted one woman doing her full share under the hot sun carried a lusty one-year-old boy on her hip this is a marked distinction between japan and india while in the former country babies are always carried on the back in india they are invariably borne astride the hip women work hard in ajmer by the dork bungalow i saw a file of a dozen chiefly young girls uplifted high on an unfinished house busily engaged in bricklaying the drawing and carrying of water is an important item in the day's work in most towns water is supplied in frequent wells approachable from the street level at ajmer the daily store of water is found in a dip between two walls of rock approached by steep flights of steps one rock rising sheer out of the water was almost literally hidden from view by a cloud of pigeons that clung to its rugged front it was a pretty sight the constant stream of straight lithe women in many-coloured kirtles coming and going with their red jars poised on their heads some had a small ring of plaited straw which they placed on their heads and on this stood the water jar slim-necked full-bodied and rounding off at the base to a ring not larger than the palm of the hand far up at the top of the steps on the town side was a stalwart blind beggar who had miraculously caught sight of us and at short intervals broke forth into stentorian entreaty for bakshish the pigeons alarmed at the reverberation started off from the rock darkening the air in their flight i don't know what becomes of the pigeons evidently no one kills and eats them in the peepul tree under which a betel-nut man was getting shaved there were trays suspended from the boughs on which passers-by threw a few grains of rice or millet the tree was peopled with birds which when not overeating themselves hopped about as if the place belonged to them which indeed it does for no hindu would disturb them all the life of an indian bazaar dies out at sundown as it begins at sunrise there are no flaring gas-lights no crowd of promenaders 
as darkness falls over the narrow streets the goods are taken in from the ever open shop the shopkeepers disappear the shops become dark empty caverns and only here and there the glare of a miniature furnace with a man's face suddenly lighted up as he applies the blowpipe shows the late worker in silver or brass End of chapter 21「East by West A Journey in the Recess」Volume 2 by Henry W. Lucy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 Something New About India. I went to India with the depressed feeling born of listening to innumerable debates on the subject in the House of Commons. From these I gathered that India is a hopeless incubus upon the Empire a source of constant and increasing danger which might any day even to-morrow reach its crisis that india should perish or that in some other quite conclusive way england should be rid of a legacy originally created by traders and fostered by military adventurers seemed to be the best thing that could happen for this country i left india full of amazement at the fertility of her resources the steady growth of her prosperity the docility and industry of her people and full of hope for her future india is still one of the richest countries in the world though in a different way from what it was when clive extorted over two millions and a half in jewels plate and specie as a fine for the revolt of bengal the jewels and precious stones are exhausted and golconda has become but a name but fostered and encouraged by wise and watchful government the manifold natural gifts of india are being cultivated till its trade has reached colossal proportions which increase with every year fifty years ago after a quarter of a century of british rule india exported goods of the value of ten millions showing the country tenfold richer than it was before english influence prevailed in eighteen eighty india exported sixty six millions worth of its natural products making with its imports a total turnover of one hundred and twenty two millions within twelve months not the least hopeful sign in the aspect of indian trade is its adaptability and its readiness to take advantage of all the adverse circumstances of foreign nations other people's adversity has ever been india's opportunity the civil war in america gave an impetus to its cotton industry which has proved permanent the failure of crops in the united states suggested to india that it might become the great wheat-growing country of the world an expectation by no means beyond reasonable hope of fulfilment ten years ago india exported one million hundredweight of wheat three years later the exports reached over six millions hundredweight valued at three millions sterling the crimean war shutting out russian flax and hemp from dundee brought jute into use and india is now richer by a steady and increasing income and nearly four million sterling a year there is scarcely any great article of international trade which india does not produce and deal in in increasing quantities cotton jute and wheat have been alluded to but india exports rice oil seeds to the extent of six million sterling per annum indigo opium tobacco coffee cinchona an industry of recent years and tea the trade in which has multiplied fourfold in ten years and is still increasing its carpets and rugs are familiar to every english household its pottery as exemplified in the bombay school of art requires only to be better known to become a fashionable craze profitable for india and wholesome for english taste in addition to these exports india has coal not very good it is true iron of the best quality in the world copper some lead much tin petroleum and a fathomless stock of saltpetre with which it supplies the world's need of gunpowder 
with a country thus exceptionally rich in natural products it will reasonably be asked why we hear so much of the poverty of the people and of the difficulty the administration find in making both ends meet one reason for this is that for the last quarter of a century india has been plagued with famine and war the mutiny of fifty seven the great famines of eighteen seventy four and eighteen seventy six to seventy eight and the last attempt to create a scientific frontier on the north whilst they account for the unflourishing state of the indian exchequer really supply the best proofs of the natural wealth of the country and the elasticity of its revenues there are few other countries in the world that could have survived those successive blows whereas india to-day is more prosperous with fairer prospects than at any previous period of her history relief from war or what is scarcely less fatal to the prosperity of a country deliverance from the daily apprehensions born of a restless policy has come only within the last four years and the taxpayers of the country are still handicapped by the weight of expenditure incurred in the afghan war but recovery is almost complete and it is expected that the year's budget of eighteen eighty four will show a fair surplus as to the recurrence of famine the foundations of its empire are being sapped every year with the growth of irrigation famine is beaten within smaller and smaller area and when after long successive drought it rears its head the extension of railways enables the government to grapple with it for irrigation works and for the fostering of trade the natives of india have directly to thank the british government that government is in the strictest and best sense a paternal government watching over the needs and the welfare of the people with keen wise eyes and doing for them what they are either too indolent or too ignorant to do for themselves it is undeniable that in the earlier history of british rule in india there are many pages which cannot be looked upon without feelings of shame and indignation for the last thirty years since the viceroyalty of lord dalhousie the whole energies and the entire spirit of the english government have been devoted to improving the condition of the natives and of the country governments exist for the good of the governed was lord dalhousie's rule a little startling not to say blasphemous to anglo-indians of the old school but which has on the whole been adopted as the axiom of successive viceroys the result of british rule upon the condition of the natives is set forth in the incontrovertible language of facts wherever a state has been annexed it has grown in numbers prosperity and social improvement we hear from time to time much passionate sympathy expressed for the downtrodden native of india crushed under the weight of taxation as a matter of fact the rate of gross taxation paid by the natives during the ten years ending eighteen seventy nine was three shillings and eightpence a head in eighteen eighty the foray into afghanistan had increased this to four shillings a head but the british taxpayer in addition to local and municipal rates pays imperial taxes at the rate of two pounds a head in the penultimate days of the mogul empire of which england was in due course the successor eighty millions sterling were exacted in the way of taxation as against thirty-five millions now drawn whilst aurangzebe ruled over a smaller area and a considerably less population than owned the sway of victoria the famine commissioners in their report published in eighteen eighty state that throughout british india the landed classes pay revenue at the maximum rate of five shillings and sixpence a head the trading classes pay three shillings and threepence the artisans two shillings and the agricultural labourers one shilling and eightpence any native of india the commissioners add who does not trade or own land and who chooses to drink no spirituous liquor and to use no english cloth or iron conditions easily fulfilled by a native need pay in taxation only about sevenpence a year on account of the salt he consumes End quote. 
on a family of three persons the charge amounts to one and ninepence, which, it is true, is in the lowest strata equal to four days' wages of a labouring man and his wife. But what labouring man is there in England who would not gladly compound with the state by yielding four days or even seven days' labour as payment in full for all taxation, direct, indirect, local and municipal? The truth is that India has been made by England after being delivered by her strong arm from successive floods of cruel conquests and rapine afghan mussulman persian tartar or maharatta the natives who tilled the soil had no chance till the english came and it must be admitted not much immediately after though it was the rajahs fat with the spoils of each other's palaces and temples that clive and warren hastings chiefly bled all that is changed now and the good of the governed is the object of the solicitude of the governors not without some evidences of fretful irritation on the part of the descendants and successors of the old colonists india has now fairly entered upon the path of prosperity is able and i believe willing to pay the moderate price levied for the charges of good government asking only to be delivered from the ruinous fines incurred by restless foreign policy in downing street and the clash of party warfare at westminster end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of east by west a journey in the recess volume two by henry w lucy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty three a british outpost regarded as a harbour aden is one of the finest sights in the world as a home for man it is among the most desolate it yields neither fruit nor vegetables nor grows flowers nor scarcely any grass or green thing its hills yield no fresh streams nor is water to be had by digging wells condensed water is the sole resource of the colonists and beef alternating with mutton their daily fare except when friendly ships bring rare presents of fowl or game the harbour and the european settlement are built on a narrow strip of sandy gravelly land lying at the feet of hard bare brown rocks somebody must from time to time sojourn here for there are two hotels whose high-sounding names contrast with the desolation of the scene nothing less than the hotel de l'univers unless it be the hotel de l'europe will do for aden it is a pathetic fancy this all europe nay all the universe hurrying out to make a stay at aden and here are the hotels with green verandas awaiting their reception with a waiter standing in either doorway ready to take the universal orders but in the meanwhile yawning and lazily flapping at flies with a dirty napkin aden itself the native town peopled by arabs africans and a miscellaneous horde of nationalities much out of the elbows lies four miles inland we drove thither passing out of the neighbourhood of the two hotels by stores of coal which tell the enormous business done at this halfway house to india to-day there is stored in aden seventy thousand tons of coal chiefly imported from cardiff the price just now runs as high as thirty-five shillings a ton which is moderately cheap during the abyssinian war the price of coals at aden was run up eight pounds a ton government must have coal for their transports and men of war and patriotic stockholders held on till they got their price just now a hundred steamers a month call at aden chiefly to coal from which it will appear that somebody turns over a pretty penny in compensation for the absence of all other joys of life but there is a cloud rising over aden which may work its ruin at present it is no bigger than a little island in the red sea called perim perim also belongs to england and has been leased to a private company 
who hope that it will some day supplant Aden as a coaling station. It has many natural advantages, including a fine harbour, and offers the inducement of increased cheapness of coal. At Aden a big steamer cannot let go its anchor and haul it up again under a fine of twenty pounds. There are no port charges at Perim, which is, moreover, directly on the route, and a day's steaming nearer to Cardiff. It is, however, as a naval station, an outpost of the British Empire, that Aden is chiefly prized, and as such it will always hold its own. At present the fort is not very heavily armed, its biggest guns being nine-inch muscle loaders of twelve tons, practically obsolete in these days of ironclads. The guns are mounted on the open barbette system, pretty to look at but dangerous to serve. This is to be altered at something like an expenditure of a hundred thousand pounds. New guns of twenty-six tons are to be placed in armoured cupolas, and all points within the harbour at which a landing might be effected by an enemy will be protected by light guns. At Aden, as at Hong Kong, a place practically defenceless against first-class ironclads, trust has hitherto been placed in the watchfulness of the fleet. It is intended to place Aden in a position in which, like Gibraltar, it can answer for itself. This is a work quietly undertaken by a government understood in some quarters to be careless of national defences, and particularly reckless of the safety of our empire in the east. I hear at Aden of another little stroke of business, effected without blare of trumpets and uncelebrated in music halls. Just facing Aden and commanding the harbour, there juts out a rocky promontory which, should it be seized by an enemy or acquired by a friendly power, would immeasurably reduce the value of Aden as a naval and military post. In 1869, when Mr. Gladstone's government was supposed to be absorbed with such humdrum things as reforming churches, freeing land, and creating a system of national education, this long-overlooked coin of vantage was quietly bought from the Arab chief who held its suzerainty. One day, Lieutenant, now Major Hogg, in command of a troop of sinned horse stationed on the narrow spit of sand where the cavalry lines lie, received instructions to go and take possession, in the Queen's name, of this potential Gibraltar. So little was known of the district that he was informed that the journey skirting the bay would be seven miles. He found it fifteen, and though the little troop had started with the hope of arriving at their destination before the heat made day insufferable, it was high noon when the fagged horses and men reached their camping place. At sunrise the next morning, amid a salute from the cavalry, the British flag floated from the barren rock, announcing to whom it might concern that this was British soil. At sunset the flag was taken down, the process being repeated every day for a week, at the end of which time the troops trotted back, and a new, though exceedingly rough, diamond had been added to the circlet of the British crown. Nothing has been done since, but I believe that little Aden, as it is called for want of a better name, is forthwith to be fortified, completing the impregnability of the harbour. Driving along the road skirting the bay on the way to Aden town, we passed on the right hand the burial place where hundreds of natives were huddled during the last cholera epidemic. It would be impossible for words to convey an idea of the desolateness of this place. It is not even enclosed, and all but a few of the graves are nameless and unmarked, save by the little mounds that rise out of the unkempt shingle. Behind, bare and bleak, ungraced by tree or shrub, and unblessed by blade of grass, rise the forbidding hills of volcanic rock. In front is the sea, with glimpses beyond of a jagged coast and an illimitable stretch of desert. Here, when the sun has gone down and the sea moans all round, sits death in the dark alone. Quote, all shores about and afar lie lonely, 
but lonelier this than the heart of grief. End quote. We passed on the road many Arabs leading strings of camels loaded with elephant grass, the principal fodder yielded by the district. One camel went by with a load of rough but sweet scented hay. A gharry drove by with an Arab and three children in the front seat. The back part under the hood had a cloth drawn down, closely veiling the inmates, presumably the wives of the gentlemen on the box seat, who thus sadly took their pleasure on a morning's drive. A little ahead was a lanky Arab on a minute donkey. The man carried a little child fast asleep on his breast. What with the heat of the sun and the distraction born of the united duties of caring for the sleeping infant and keeping his feet off the ground, he perspired freely. Through the covered way flanked by the fort, we came upon a funeral procession of Arabs. The leader, dressed in white, held in his arms a packet wrapped in matting, through the open end of which peeped a tiny bare brown foot. About twenty Arabs, chiefly dressed in white, followed in a regular procession, singing a monotonous chant. I hope they were not going to bury the little thing among the shingle under the hill. Nearer Aden, just before the road turns off to mount the hill that leads to the town, there is another graveyard, not much better kept, but lying in a shadier nook, with an outlet upon another position of the bay, where the blue waters fall in tiny breakers around purple islets. Doubtless that was their destination. Most of the people we met on the road were Arabs, fine, handsome men, with erect bearing and lithe, springy step. But there was a considerable sprinkling of Somalis, a race who come from the other side of the Red Sea. Many of these had their woolly hair curled and tinted yellow, a mode at one time, I believe, popular among ladies of fashion in London. I do not know how they acquired the adornment, but the process in vogue among the Somalis is very simple. On the shore by the port he finds a soft yellow mud with which he liberally plasters his head. This is left on for a week, during which time it is sufficiently baked by the sun. The head is then washed, the woolly hair put into curl papers, and the Somali beau walks about with the conviction that he is rather fetching. Aden Town lies, as it were, in the bottom of a cup, the sides being rugged volcanic hills. It must be a fearful place in summer. In these January days it is dangerous to appear out of doors without a sun helmet or a terai, which is simply composed of two felt hats, one fitting close upon the top of the other. The streets are narrow and dirty, swarming with black-eyed children, chiefly naked, who run after the carriage and lisp for bakshish. There is also a choice collection of deformity, the fortunate possessors of which close round the visitor and make it almost impossible to proceed a few yards on foot. Another nuisance are the money-changers, who cannot be convinced that the chief object of one landing in Aden is not either to get rupees changed into English money or English money converted into rupees. One of these men spent the whole morning with us holding out a handful of silver. It was a little monotonous, but we got used to it in time, and he seemed to be enjoying himself. The one thing Aden has to show to the tourist are its famous tanks. These are scooped out of hills standing a little above town. They are natural excavations, nature having been but slightly assisted by art. There is a series of four or five tanks, yawning cauldrons, each one capable of holding thousands of gallons of water, if it could only get them. That is, however, the drawback. The tanks are quite empty now, as they always are, except for a short period after unusually heavy rains. They are no use for the purpose for which it is naturally supposed they were constructed, that of supplying Aden with water. When the rains do come after the long drought, 
they bring down tons of mud the washings of the dusty hills it would take a year with a constant supply of fresh and cleaner water before the store could be used for domestic purposes but the government whose property the tanks are manage to turn them to commercial account these washings of the hills are full of manurial properties for which the agriculturists for miles around compete last year the dirty water sold for eight hundred pounds and went to irrigate a thirsty land as to the origin of these colossal reservoirs it is lost in remote antiquity the generally accepted theory is that they were made by the romans who once had a settlement here they were accidentally discovered some years ago and the rubbish with which they had been gradually filled was cleared away at the expense of the government they are approached by a neatly kept garden in which at nearly every turn is set up an earnest request that visitors will not pluck the flowers this i fancy is a bitter joke for scarcely any flowers will bloom in this enclosed space on which the sun beats down with a terrible power that dries up the thinly sprinkled soil we returned to the port by another route on which the dust was laid by water carts drawn by camels from this road not aden but the prospect from its hills looked fairer the volcanic peaks on the opposite shore were doubtless as brown and desolate as that on which we stood but seen at a distance across the blue bay they were dowered with soft reds and deep purples whilst here and there the riven masses opened up glimpses of golden sand End of chapter 23